Last August, when Amy Sherman was here, she challenged us to think about our calling beyond just as a platform to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is one way that we fulfill our calling. She also said it's more than just a platform to share the gospel. It's more than just a way to show the justice and mercy of Christ. That is uh, true about our calling. But to believe that our work is a gracious extension of the redeeming and the renewing of the work of Christ in the world. Uh, it's a step beyond just sharing the gospel, which is very important with, from our platform, beyond just showing the uh, character of Christ. It's also participating in the redeeming and renewing work of Christ. We have a panel here to talk about health care. Peggy Green, Dave Habercheck, Sean Lynch, Megan Mobley, and Clark Newton. And um, I'm going to ask this first question. It's not a political conversation today, but I am going to ask Dave to answer this uh, and respond to these statistics. It says that, um, well, I wrote down, no American can be neutral in their view of health care since now uh, health care has uh, become the most talked about issue in news and media. In a major Gallup poll, while 69% of Americans rate their personal health care coverage as excellent or good, only 32% rate health care coverage in the country very highly. Americans are becoming more positive about health care coverage when Barack Obama took office 2010, but the ratings show a lower and lower view of hope for health care in the last two years. Americans rate their own health care coverage remarkably steady, but yet not very optimistic about the future. And health care providers have become confused, exhausted, and even cynical as hospitals, insurance companies, litigation, the government, and all types of patients who have watched a commercial or they have searched WebMD want to tell health care providers how to do health care. I'm sorry, that's true. The good commercial convinces us, Dave. But just frame for us, when did medicine become health care and how has this impacted medicine and how do Christians navigate through fulfilling their call? Let's talk about the big picture first. Well, I think the first thing that I would say is um, reading about Matthew 9 talks. Jesus uh, is berated because he uh, brings Matthew into the fold and Jesus' comment is that people are healthy don't need physicians. Um, and I think part of the problem has been over the last 30, 40 years in particular, probably starting about the 1960s, with the changes in financing of medicine, and it was medicine up until then, that uh, we've become kind of Walmarted uh, in terms of efficiency, effectiveness, um, mantras that deal with um, the mass utilization of resources for the provision of health as well as the provision of people that are ill. And I think that uh, as a physician uh, who uh, is given the opportunity to take care of people that are sick, uh, I think it would apply to everybody here and probably the angst is the fact that this is not an issue that's just for the people that are physicians and nurses and healthcare administrators. It's everybody's issue because all of us are going to get sick and all of us are going to have the opportunity to take care of people that are sick. And I think if you lose the focus of taking care of people that are sick in the realm of saying you're being more efficient in terms of doing this or doing that, that's where the angst is. And the other aspect I think that's specific is the amount of time that's involved. It takes time to take care of sick people. Uh, and increasingly, and all of you know that from your families and yourselves, uh, it takes uh, a personal effort and you are suffering with the individual that you're caring for. And it, it takes time to do that. And if you're graded on a number of people that you see in a given amount of time, the margins are the issue, the cost and effectiveness and the documentation is the issue, it takes away from that. And so I think the biggest single struggle has been uh, effectively doing 
uh, the care of individuals that are sick. And you see people at their worst when they're sick. You don't see them when they're at their best. Uh, and it's really an opportunity to be able to come alongside individuals. And that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 25, about the sheep and the goats. Uh, we see Jesus in the sicknesses that we see and the people that we see. And the kingdom of God is built individual by individual. It's not everybody's converted all at once, and it's not a mass production process. So I think the, the key for me has been to recognize that every single person that I see is in the image of God and working with that particular individual to best and kind of focus on them and be with them and be a presence with them. If I've got five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes or half an hour, whatever it is, uh, to use that moment and focus and not multitask, but focus with that individual. Good. Well, we started there. We're going to land there and come back and talk about just the, the major challenges because we're really asking the question, is our help helping? And what does it mean to help? And as a Christian, what does it mean to help? And uh, I think we even can ask some questions about the system. Is it really helping? But before we, we're going to land there, but before we get to that point, uh, Sean, I want you to just talk about your understanding of calling and how it evolved both in your conversion, but also your understanding of calling to medicine. Kind of give us an overview of, and then what you see now as, as God's call in your life. And no, y'all know where we're going. We're going to get to some of the you might say dilemmas that David's bringing up, both as a Christian and as the system, whether or not it's really helping and what can we help and what does help look like? But Sean, let's talk about calling. So <clears throat> my mother started going to a church when I was about 12 or 13 and this church used the term higher calling as it beat into the brains of the teenagers that we should all go be pastors or missionaries and and I remember when I became a believer, I was 18 or 19, um, <clears throat> doing EMT training in the military. And as soon as I became a Christian, I thought, well, okay, well, I need to go to a Christian college and I'm supposed to be a missionary. So I, I went to an unnamed Christian college, the only one that I knew. And after a year, they asked me not to come back. And <clears throat> I, I left very discouraged because during that year, I decided I wanted to be a doctor and that, you know, so the only, the only way I could be a Christian doctor was if I was like a Christian missionary doctor. And so I, I was really kind of confused and thankfully, um, I landed at Covenant College and Covenant, you know, through the teaching of Abraham Kuyper and just Martin Luther's idea that there's a priesthood of all believers and the milkmaid is you know, I'm no lower standing than the priest. And, and I, I started gaining some confidence that my calling as a physician could be my calling. I mean, all Christians are called to witness, to be salt and light. I mean, that's, that's the basic requirement of being a Christian. But being a physician was, was a calling. And so I, you know, went about going to medical school invigorated that my calling as a physician was a was a legitimate calling and you know that brought us to augusta and <clears throat> this church and and just reading through books like oz guinness's the call and nt wright um, has a book called surprised by hope that really altered my thinking about you know being a christian doctor doesn't mean you know, every patient that comes into my exam room, I have to pray with them. And if I, if I don't pray with them, then man, you know, I'm discouraged. I didn't, I didn't fulfill my Christian calling as a doctor. And, and I think, I think that's, that was the mentality that I had, that my Christianity came out through evangelism, not necessarily just being a doctor and loving patients and passing my boards and, you know, trying to be an excellent physician. And, um, N.T. Wright had this, <clears throat> had this quote about how the average American Christian looks at becoming a Christian as kind of a, a one-way ticket to heaven. Like you get your, you get your ticket punched, you're going to heaven, and, and your life is going to be spent on golden streets and singing and playing the harp, and, and how that 
that affects what we do every day because we see no value in what we do because our eternal destiny is heaven. And, and so he confronts that by saying, you know, Jesus is coming back to the earth and he's going he's gonna to put all things right. Everything has been marred by sin. And, and that as a physician, he used the example of healing disease as taking things back to the way God originally created them and that everything we do has eternal significance. And so, I mean, I think it was really that, that changed my idea of what it meant to be a Christian physician because I, I all of a sudden saw value in every little thing I was trying to put back the way God created it and that it would have eternal significance. And so I think now, you know, the, the hard thing about that is just seeing that the, that the gospel has to infuse every single thing I do. <clears throat> how I run my practice, how I treat my employees, how, how I treat my patients. And, and, and doing that obviously is something that you, is a lifelong lesson. I'm give Peggy the mic. And um, Peggy's a woman physician, a mother, wife, Bible study leader. I know you would say, I'm not Wonder Woman, Mother Teresa, or the Easter Bunny, but... <laughs> I had to make Peggy come up here. She did not want to be a part of this panel. So uh, I twisted her. I blackmailed her. That's right. The things I know about her that I will tell if she didn't come. <laughs> but you are humble. That's why I wanted you here with me. And the way that you live your life is just a commitment to serve others. And as you teach those Bible studies, you teach these women, medical wives and sometimes medical students. Just talk, talk about your calling Talk about those things that are important to you. And, and, and as I said, we already said, you're not Wonder Woman, Mother Teresa, the Easter Bunny. We, so we put the humility, the self-deprecation gone. Now tell us what you do. <laughs> All right. We want to hear from you about that. So Mike is a great arm twister. <laughs> We've been friends for many years. So um, I really was very reluctant to do this. But um, in sharing about what I feel my calling has been, hopefully, um, he said, and I agree with this, that maybe we can challenge others of you to really establish your priorities in the Lord and to um, look to what the Lord would have you do. So um, when I look back, at the, he had asked me what guided um, my sense of calling. And I would say that I feel like my sense of calling has been multifactorial on many different fronts. Um, my, um, first to my family. And then I felt my calling was to, and they kind of alluded to this, Sean has, to be um, an excellent ophthalmologist, providing care for my patients and showing them the love of Christ, um, both in word and deed. And then later in my life, I've really had learned this overarching call, and that is to really come alongside the next generation and to challenge them in their walk um, so that's also been a focus for me. So I just thought I would kind of share a little bit of how, I, as Sean did, how I got to this, because these things kind of evolved for me. Um, when Troy and I first came back after residency to Augusta and opened our practices, we had decided that my first priority would be to care for our family. So I worked um, part-time, very limited practice uh, in a group situation for nine years. After that, I left that group so that I could set my time better, so that I could try to be home in the afternoons, and I went um, in, into my own practice. And really my focus was to be exactly sort of as Sean described. I felt like I wanted to provide excellent care in, a, in an efficient office, caring environment, and to be able to share um, and pray with patients as it was needed. Um, then, um, when my children were young, Bruce Kitchen came along and asked me to be on the board at Westminster. And um, at that time, I really became passionate about Christian education because I really caught the vision of changing the and preparing the next generation of leaders and that's what I felt like we were doing so the call was really to um, for these students to change give them a Christian worldview give them the skills that they need 
and um, also to give them a heart to serve. And so I really was involved in that ministry for 20 plus years. And that seemed to translate into uh, my next phase. All the time still trying to instill those same values in my own family. Um, so um, we always in this church had a ministry to medical students. I never really felt like I could be involved because I had so many other commitments. But in the early years, Bill Pearson and others had a vision for changing that ministry to, um, and called it Medical Campus Outreach. And it was along the campus outreach model that these, this young whippersnapper, Mike Heron, and his group brought <laughs> to First Press. Take that as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> it was, and you know, those of us who have been here a long time have just rejoiced and seen what the Lord has done through Mike's leadership in campus outreach and the growth that I've seen in medical campus outreach, the Clark has just been really exciting. In those um, early years, we didn't have it, quite as many women, but we, uh, Vicki Lee Mead, then Mead was um, the women's director. And so I came along her and we uh, joined her in Bible study with just four girls. She was really doing the discipling part and I was trying to help with just some of the medical connections and how they could see that happen. Um, she left for Philly and then I continued with that group and have been um, in Bible studies with medical students since that time. And again, our goal is to um, come alongside these women and in give them the tools they need, challenge them in their walk with the Lord, and hopefully that they will go ahead and transform their families and their communities, the world, wherever that may be. I also um, really wanted to get involved with these women because I feel like many of them really don't have a clue about what they're getting into. Because I know that I didn't when I started. The medical profession's a very challenging. It takes very time consuming. Um, I have found it physically and emotionally demanding if you care about your patients and you're involved in whatever problems they have. Hard not to take it home. And, um, and I think just when you throw in a family on all of that, it's really a difficult road. And so I just wanted to encourage these girls early in their career to establish biblical priorities to help them figure out which would be the best field of medicine to go into for them that would utilize their gifts and abilities. Um, so that's what I've just continued to focus on in doing Bible studies with these um, girls. That has really been our goal. We do that. We try to model this for them on mission trips. And um, we also just have a panel for the women. We have a panel discussion um, every year where we bring in different women physicians in different specialties. And so they can see that, sort of as Sean said too, that um, each of us can be called and serve the Lord in many different ways. And we want them to see some of these opportunities of this in um, women who really love the Lord and have a heart to serve Him here and abroad. So as I said, my, it's been a multifactorial calling through these years, but um, I, it's just been wonderful to be a part of what the Lord's done here. See, that didn't hurt too bad, did it? Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> I've sat in her office when she's taking care of my eyes. It's just, the, that wasn't too bad, see? You survive it. Okay, Clark, we're gonna actually go to you because that's a perfect segue. Uh, that idea of changing the the landscape by really impacting the future physicians. Let's talk about your calling and how we want to be doing that in greater, greater ways and, and uh, what Medical Camp Search is all about. I mean, Peggy did a better job than I can of, of trends, of vocalizing some of those things. I guess I'd start with, um, I came to know Christ um, 25 years ago as a member or as a visitor of this church and through the early uh, beginnings of what became uh, Medical Campus Outreach. And from that early age, I felt like as I had come to know Christ and I went back in that lecture hall with all those students, I felt like um, those were my people that I understood their fears, their 
um, insecurities. I felt like I knew their games they were playing to gain significance and value and purpose and how they had hidden behind their gifts and their abilities. And I felt like God was um, growing within me a desire not only to, um, to interact with them, to confront them with the gospel, and I felt like I was an insider to that. And as God was doing that in some of the hearts of several of the others, um, I think the thing that we started recognizing is that the healthcare communities of our country are really an, an unreached people group. And in many ways, I'd say they still remain an unreached people group. They're just, no one really targets the healthcare communities um, for whatever reason, but they've just sort of been left alone in our country. And as I continued in my training, I developed more and more heart to, well, maybe I could be a part of that. And seeing the, what Peggy was saying, the opportunity that if you take students in those fund in those formative years, you know, before they get the money and the titles and all the God complexes that comes with so many healthcare providers, and you embrace them with the gospel and you equip them and establish them and you help see them help them develop a vision for others. There's this unique window that we have in healthcare, and so that passion continued to grow. Um, one of the challenges we faced as they were sharing is you get busy and medicine demands so much of you, so how do you do that? And one of the things that God put on our hearts, well, well what if we were able to back off on our medicine? So instead of working a full-time load, what if you backed off a day or two a week and devoted that to student ministry? And so this concept of a tent maker model has grown and matured so that you have proximity to the students, you have um, a credibility because you are one of them, and, and you can finance. I mean, we we're, we're, have been paid well, um, and so you're not dependent on outside sources for that. And so this tent maker model has grown, and it's been exciting, um, and, it's, and God has spread, and I, I still say that um, healthcare communities are unreached people groups in our country, and um, we're still fighting for that. I think the thing that I have grown a lot in now doing this for 18 years or so, I think early on, my passion really was to see disciples, um, and, and that hasn't changed, but I don't think I valued health care as much as I do now, and, and trust that I'll continue. don't really think I valued how incredible the opportunities we have to take the gospel to that patient there before you, and as, you know, in leading a ministry to healthcare providers, there's opportunities we have right now as a healthcare country, I mean, as a healthcare community in this country, to really take and encourage students to do these very things. Um, I mean, there is a lot of cynicism, criticism, cynicism, negative in, in medicine, but the people still have needs and they still hurt. And um, if we can't find a way as the church, um, who else is going to do that? And I see, if anything, the window before us is maybe greater than it's ever been, that if we can't find a way as a church, you know, our, our society is probably not going to find that way, and we have to be at the forefront of doing that. And I think that's particularly true in two areas with the mentally ill and, and the elderly, and it's kind of funny coming from a pediatrician, but, um, but that's really a lot of been my rally with the students lately, is, is trying to encourage them not just toward better hours or um, where you're not going to get sued or, or um, whatever you necessarily just enjoy, but realizing our calling, particularly to those age groups where I think if we as a society don't find ways to take the gospel there, don't find ways just to meet them physically that nobody else will. I don't know if everybody knows this, but our MCO, of course, is working here locally and we have that team down in Peru, but Clark's involved with a team that's in Athens and Orlando and we're launching a team to Macon and Columbia, South Carolina. And we're Matt Humble and we're launching a team to Raleigh, North Carolina. We're gonna be involved with Duke and UNC medical students here starting this fall. And so the Lord is using this focus uh, to begin to really build an army we're praying uh, to impact healthcare. So we're excited about it. Did I miss, were there other, yeah, that's great. Uh, Megan. It's not just about physicians, it's also about the full care that nurses, physical therapists, a broad range of people uh, come alongside and participate in this. You're a physical therapist, and I'd love for you to share just ways that you, you, know, you mentioned to me, uh, the opportunities through uh, extended connections, but also through the burn 
uh, exposure to burn patients. Talk about both of those ways that you found opportunities to live out your calling. Okay. Um, the draw to me to even enter into the field of physical therapy was the amount of time that we have um, to spend with our patients. So depending on what setting you work in, you can spend 15 minutes to an hour and a half a day with these people. And so um, really growing in relationships, um, loving them well through this, and also I think being a part of helping restore uh, their bodies physically. Um, I think it's exciting for me to see patients walk again that came in and they aren't walking or uh, to assist in helping them learn how to feed themselves again. Basic things that we take for granted every day, but people lose them temporarily and we get to play a role in um, helping to restore them and regain their independence that was uh, temporarily lost. And, um, um, and I think just it's exciting for me to see those things be regained and restored and I feel like the Lord uses us to place hands on patients and and um, help to physically restore their bodies um, and then I'd say on the other side I, I felt the Lord calling me to the burn center in Augusta at Doctors Hospital which I grew up in Augusta and I didn't realize what unique opportunity uh, we have here in Augusta it's the largest burn center in the country. Patients are flown from all over the southeast um, to this hospital that we have in Augusta, from North Florida to Kentucky, Virginia, Mississippi. They're all flying here um, to be treated. And if it's a large enough injury, they're here for six months or more. So as a physical therapist in this setting, I see them the, day, the first day they come in, I'm doing my evaluation, seeing them in the ICU, and then I'm following them. Um, to the regular medical uh, surge floor. Um, and then even a year out, they're following up in the clinic um, for scar management. And so really being able to walk alongside on, in the early days um, with these patients and their families, being able to extend the love of Christ to them, their lives have just been um, uprooted from where they are coming from. Um, being able to love them in a city they they know no one they don't know how even to get around and um nobody plans to be burned so it's just a traumatic time and there's a lot of uh fears and anxieties um and just being able to, to love um, patients and their families through this time and and just growing in relationship too as i get excited when they come back to the clinic for follow-up because um, i just feel like almost part of the family that i've helped them go through this whole process yeah, the Lord is the healer, but just to think of participating that directly in seeing uh, someone walk or seeing their, their skin regrow in places where it's been burned, that's, that's a gift. Well, uh, I'm gonna, uh, I think we're going to let Sean answer this question, and then Dave, we're going to let you answer the last question. I started, Sean, with this idea, health care providers are confused, exhausted, cynical as hospitals, insurance companies, litigation, the government at times, and even patients tries to tell us how, how to care for others, what that's to look like. Sometimes as Christians, our temptation is just to disconnect and just say, well, you know what, I'm just going to get mine and I'll, you know, I'll just kind of disconnect. And, but yet, how are we as believers to engage this brokenness, even the system that is broken, and have an influence. I want you to talk about it more systemically and holistically. And Dave, I want you to finish with, as a Christian, what advice would you give us to move into this? What hope do we have and, and what advice you give? So first you, Sean, and then last, Dave. So maybe three years ago, you know, I'd been in practice for seven years and like all of us, you get comfortable and I kind of <clears throat> surveyed the future and thought, okay, well, I can just keep doing what I'm doing and it's easy and, you know, I don't have to start a new business. I can just show up to work, be a good physician, and, and I kind of thought that would be a nice way to live out the rest of my life. And, um, and, and an interesting thing happened when a, a CEO of a business called me and asked me if I would be on the board of this organization. And being a very selfish person, I, I mean, I, I'm in shock that I actually said it and not just thought it, but I, I said to him, well, well, how does this benefit me? And uh, <laughs> so it was, it's painful as I think back of it. And um, 
And, and I was thinking, I'm busy, you know, I have, I have all these other things, I have four kids. Um, and he just said, well, think about it for a week or two and, and get back with me. So I have a physician friend, he's about 70 years old, and he's a, <clears throat> he's a strong believer. And so I called him, and I really hadn't realized how, how selfish I had been until I then repeated what I had said to the CEO of, uh, hey, you know, what, what, of what benefit would, be, would this be to me as I'm thinking through whether I should do this? And, and he said, well, you know, Sean, I was actually the person who recommended you be on the board. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it is funny how God works those things out. And, and, and he, said, um, he said, there are no Christians on this board. And he said, I, I really think you could be an influence in moving this organization towards, you know, just a more holistic Christian model. And so, you know, that was the point at which it hit me like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm so selfish. And, and what, but what that really did was begin to see how God puts us in positions that are unique to our callings as a physician to shape what healthcare looks like. And, and so I, you know, in, in going through my own selfishness and seeing that there, there is a value in my calling as a physician, that God also calls us to help shape the structures of how we're gonna deliver healthcare. And, and so it was interesting that have, having God open my eyes to that, um, Unfortunately, there came a deluge of other opportunities to sit on the board of family medicine or, or to work in an ACO that's trying to, I mean, if you guys have heard that term in, in the news, it's part of the, the new healthcare model where rather than when you're sick, you go to the doctor, the doctor gets paid for your illness. It's, I, I think, actually a better model of how do we keep people healthy and taking healthcare dollars and try to attribute them to the promotion of health, not just the, the treatment of disease. Um, so it was, it was kind of a wake-up call to me, really, just that, that we as Christian physicians can't just disengage from our, our profession, that we need to be active in promoting principles that, I mean, God, God established gravity. He established laws of the universe that, that you know, we, we might say that they're Christian, but they're, they're the way we're created. And, and so we have, we have an opportunity to give a philosophical reason for, for why this truth exists. And, and so um, just, just to be open to the idea that these structures that God, I mean, God created these things. Work, God worked before the fall. So we were all created for work. And, you know, work isn't a punishment. And so, so this, the idea that our, our work, we are, we are doing what God did. The fall, sin entered in and everything's broken, including the systems. And so um, it, 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 God opened my eyes to that idea that, that there is value in trying to bring the gospel even to the system that delivers care. We'll close with this, Dave. Um, of course, give us your advice, but also tell us in your calling on a day-by-day, person-by-person, your perspectives and guidance to how, how we should be as believers helping, what is really help all about. Okay. I'd like to, I am very much encouraged by my colleagues here, and I would also emphasize that uh, where the future is in healthcare and medicine predominantly is in those two groups that you mentioned, the mentally ill and also in the elderly. That's where the action is right now increasingly. And I would say that um, just for advice for the young people that are here, there are two pieces of advice I would have is uh, sort of going along with Sean said, uh, you'll have opportunities that you wouldn't dream of that God will put before you. 
There'll be uh, things that'll open up. There'll be different kinds of opportunities in secular organizations, in organizations you thought that weren't even in your town, like burn units, uh, that uh, will give you a tremendous opportunity to, to be a witness for, for Jesus Christ. And be a person that has the intent normally to say yes rather than say no. Uh, as busy as you are, and as busy as you are with your lives uh, and everybody else, uh, God will move things around. He'll shift resources. He'll bring other people in to carry the load with you. You're not in it just by yourself. God is for you and with you to do his work. So the first thing I would do is say yes more than say no uh, to opportunities. Um, I never dreamed that I would have been in internal medicine, first of all, when I was deciding to, to becoming a physician, uh, that I would be doing uh, infectious disease or take care of AIDS patients for 33 years and um, deal with a lot of mentally ill and prisoners and things like that, which are a tremendous opportunity. People are very, very far from the Lord, and you just can move them a little bit of the way closer just by being yourself and having the Holy Spirit work through you. Um, but I think the other opportunity, too, and the other recommendation I would have, is very easy uh, in the practice of nursing and medicine and physical therapy and other things to get involved in the abstract, to deal with uh, this case of this disease uh, and look at the, you know, the pathophysiology and the scientific aspects of it. And there are many, many people that get experts on uh, very, very many of these things. But what you don't want to do is lose track of the human being that you come into the room with. Uh, there are certain people who are at the hospital, you shudder when you want, you have to knock on the door to go in. But when you leave, you find out that um, after all, that was uh, really more of a spiritual experience than a medical experience. Uh, and it's an experience that benefited you as much or more than the patient. Um, hospitals in particular, and my practice has always been in the secular hospitals, both military and GRU, uh, are really sacred ground. And I think part of what we've lost in medicine is we've converted from hospitals to medical centers. Uh, and hospitals were places named after hospice, which was to provide care for pilgrims on the road. And they were people that were seeking or in their journey of life. And we have this tremendous opportunity, whether it's in the clinic, ophthalmology clinic, or whether it's in a family medicine clinic, or whether it's uh, coming alongside people who are training medical students or burn units to share a little part of the journey uh, that they have. And so learn the journey of the people that you're taking care of, the mentally ill and the elderly especially. Uh, don't think of them as just vessels of diseases, uh, but think of them uh, as human beings uh, created in the image of God that uh, unfortunately have been marred by sin, sometimes multiple generations of sin. And uh, you have the opportunity of being salt and light just for a little bit for their lives. That's actually a perfect way to end, and I'm going to risk... No, give it back to him. Um, <laughs> I know you're, have you finished a book or just written a book? I just want everybody to know about that. Tell them okay. what, you, what you've done. And well, after 30 some years of taking care of patients with HIV, I I've came to the conclusion kind of late, sort of like you did, um, that I didn't understand my patients. I didn't understand where they were coming from or why they behaved the way they did. And you think 33 years into an epidemic that's pretty clear cut how you get it, uh, why we still see new people coming in with new diseases uh, after all the effort that the government and everybody else has made uh, for this. And so looking at this uh, from the perspective of the patient, I found out that about 80% or so of my patients have been sexually molested as children. And uh, when you look at a lot of the problems uh, that are chronic pain syndromes and chronic different diseases, find out that childhood abuse of various kinds plays a huge role in the downstream effects. And so I wrote a book about um, the whole holistic perspective of childhood sexual abuse, mm -hmm. particularly as it applies to uh, the, starting out with one of my patients. Mm -hmm. 
So um, it's at a publisher right now. They're working on it, and I shudder to think how much is going to be chopped up. But uh, we'll hear about this next week from uh, Mrs. Myers, uh, and she's giving me a little bit of encouragement here uh, along the way. But that's another opportunity uh, that I've had because the Lord freed up the time, frankly, in my life to be able to do, uh, to do the, um, the story. Well, dream how God can use your gifts and experiences to bless this generation and the generations to come for Christ's glory. Thank you for sharing that. Let me close this in prayer. Father, on any and every calling, we know that it's beyond what, humanly speaking, we can provide that uh, would bring help and healing. And yet in the gospel, in our hands, you've put in our hearts, Lord, you've put powerful, transformative ideas that change hearts and lives for all of eternity. And help us know, especially these physicians, these health care providers, moms, dads, community members, neighbors, those who take care of their parents. Help us to know what it really means to love in Jesus' name. We know that's our call, but we also know that's our privilege. And continue to teach us uh, in this uh, study and reflection on calling how we as the church can move into the world to bring and be a healing agent for Christ's sake. We ask this in His name. Amen. Dismissed.